like to talk on the topic what we have learned about craniofemoral management. As you have heard, I'm a pediatrician, so we will talk mainly about childhood onset craniofemoral. And this first slide gives you an overview. The craniofemoral is a benign tumor located in the skull base, but the close uh, proximity to the neighboring structures such as pituitary, hypothalamic area, and you see here the uh, the the optic nerve and the carotid arteries, this close proximity makes it clinically, let's say, malignant. It's not, not a, a benign tumor when we look at the patients. Because in only very rare cases, a complete resection is possible, as you can see here. This is uh, the rare case with a patient where the tumor is removed completely and you still see the pituitary stalk. In most cases, that's not possible because the tumor has a supracellular extension and a second second reason which actually makes complete resections rather impossible is the fact that many pathologists tell us that this tumor has protrusions into the neighboring healthy brain tissue and these protrusions they lead to relapses of the tumor. So another mainstay of the therapy is uh, external irradiation. Here you see proton beam therapy and the main reason is to remove the tumor, but also to, to um, assure a good quality of life, which is actually endangered by hypothalamic syndrome. And the main symptom of this hypothalamic syndrome, which, um, is, um, which is a danger when the tumor has a hypothalamic involvement or the treatment affects the hypothalamus, is severe obesity, as you can see here by BMI SDS of the patients. Okay. Okay, when we started many years ago, two year, two, uh, 20 years ago, our first question was how frequent is this hypothalamic syndrome and the severe obesity in our patients? And this slide shows you the BMI SDS of two cohorts. On the left side, you see the patients who were normal weight at the time point of diagnosis and in yearly intervals. And on the right side of the graph, you see that there is a second cohort and that's approximately 50% of all patients, they develop severe obesity. Uh, and as you can see, we were surprised that especially during the first year after diagnosis, there is a steady and steep increase in BMI SDS in these patients who are at risk for obesity. And we were really surprised to see that these patients who were at risk for severe obesity, they were already more obese at the time point of diagnosis, which means before treatment when compared to patients without risk for obesity. So this observation led to the speculation that these patients, that the, that the risk factors and the pathogenic mechanisms leading to obesity are effective already before diagnosis and treatment. So we wanted to know whether we have any symptoms in, and uh, signs in the records of our patients. So we looked at the records and we looked at the symptoms in the history before diagnosis. And here you see a graph which shows you the frequency. Most frequent symptom was headache followed by visual impairment, growth retardation, neurological symptoms, weight gain, polyuria and polydipsia as a symptom of diabetes insipidus and also disturbances of pubertal development. And the numbers in this column shows you the time uh, before diagnosis when the first when these symptoms are noted and found in the records and as you can see looking at growth retardation that's 24 months that's a pretty long time before diagnosis and also for weight gain these symptoms occur pretty early so these records are a little bit biased because not everything is noted in the records. So we ask the questions, do we have reliable data on weight and growth development before diagnosis of craniofemoral And indeed in Germany, we have these data because, because we have a national health survey. And in this survey, all kids born are measured at the time point of birth. That's U1, we call it. U2 is in, during the first week of life and so on until U9, which is at five years of age. And we were able to look at approximately 100 patients at this data of this health survey. And in these 100 patients, later on a craniofemoral was diagnosed. So we were able to look at the, health, at the growth and uh, BMI in these patients before diagnosis. And this graph shows you the, re, uh, the, the results for the height STS, the growth before and after diagnosis of childhood craniofemoral 
this is U1, you know that's at birth, the first week and so on. Diagnosis was made at an age of, uh, at a median age of eight years. And then this is the yearly intervals after diagnosis. And as you can see, we were surprised to see that beginning with U6, there was a steady significant decrease in height velocity in these patients. They stopped to grow. And uh, when you remember U6, that at the end of the first year of life. So from this, we speculated that growth retardation is a pretty early symptom in the history of these patients who later on develop craniopharyngioma. What about weight before and after diagnosis? This graph shows the BMI STS. Once again, U1 to U9 diagnosis. And here you see that pretty late in history at U9, that's at the age of five years, there is a, an increase in BMI STS diagnosis at a median age of eight years. And this you already know from a previous slide, then one year after diagnosis, there is a steep increase. Looking at these data for BMI STS for two sub groups, the subgroup of patients without hypothalamic involvement and the patients with hypothalamic involvement, we could show that the risk for this, for the development of this severe obesity was especially the case in patients when they had hypothalamic involvement. In patients without hypothalamic involvement, there was a normal weight at the time point of birth during the first years um, at diagnosis. And they also kept their normal weight later on after diagnosis and treatment. Okay, whenever you want to, to make statements about what have we learned about our treatment, you have to look at the results of the treatment. And therefore it's very important to have long-term follow-up in patients. And in Germany, we have a registry and this registry, as you can see, we are recruiting these patients. In Germany, we have approximately 20 to 25 patients per year. So we are doing this for years and years. And up to now we have recruited uh, actually more than 700 patients with this very rare disease. And we looked at the outcome in these patients and we especially looked at this, group, at this group of patients. They were all diagnosed before the year 2001. These are 120, uh, 280 patients. And in these 280 patients, we were able to look at survival rates, overall survival and progression-free survival in 261 patients and in quality of life and psychosocial status in 108 patients. And this graph shows you the 20 year survival rates in these patients, the overall survival on the left side and the progression free survival. And these curves simply show you, and we were surprised about this, that even after very, very long follow up time of 20 years, there are frequent events in terms of death and progressions. So these patients are actually never cured for safe. They, they always have the risk of a relapse or a progression. What about the risk for overall survival and progression related to the HR diagnosis. We see the overall survival was not related to the HR diagnosis, but for very young patients of age uh, below five years of HR diagnosis, the PFS was significantly lower when compared to older patients, which means the younger you are at diagnosis, the higher the risk is for later on uh, uh, recurrences and uh, progressions. And this is actually a very important slide, especially on the right side. We looked at progression-free survival and we looked at two groups, at the group of patients with complete resections. These were the patients who received cross-total resection and patients who, who received incomplete resection. And when you look at textbooks over the years and, and decades, there was always a statement, you have to treat these patients by cross-total resection because this is uh, the best way to prevent relapses. And when we look at this cohort, there was no significant difference. There was no improvement of recurrence rate with regard to complete resection. What about hypothalamic involvement? And here we could show for the first time that indeed overall survival in these patients, we always say these patients have a good overall survival, but we could show for the first time that patients with hypothalamic involvement, they have a reduced overall survival rate when compared to patients without a hypothalamic involvement. What are the reasons of death, the causes of death in these patients? 
These were 23 patients we could analyze, patients, uh, 28 patients with hypothalamic involvement and four patients without hypothalamic involvement. And you can summarize this table in a way that on the first you have to mention that in a quarter of all patients we had, we had no, no documented um, data on the causes of death, but we could see that approximately 25% of all patients, they died due to Edisonian crisis, to salt water imbalances. And I would, I would uh, suggest or presume that many of the other patients in this group also died due to um, Edisonian crisis. Okay, this was very interesting. The lower part shows you what everybody expected uh, that many of these and most, or let's say one, almost 100% of these patients were on the hormonal medication, but we also were asking who is treating you? And then we were surprised to see that only two thirds of all patients said they were treated by an endocrinologist. And even 10% of these patients said they had no medical attendance at all, which was surprising because uh, I've shown you on the previous slide that the reasons for death. Okay, let's have a look again at uh, these two situations. This is a patient's normal weight, patient's con uh, tumor confined to the cellar area. This is a patient with severe obesity, hypothalamic syndrome due to the, the supracellular extension of this tumor. And we were also looking how is this weight development during long-term follow-up? This you already know that patients with hypothalamic involvement have this steep increase, especially during the first year after diagnosis. But in this graph, you show you see also these black boxes, and these are the data for a median follow-up of approximately 17 years, ranging from 12 to 36 years. And we were surprised to see that patients at risk for hypothalamic obesity, they develop severe obesity. You see the median BMI as yes is plus five, but this stays in a way stable at a very, very high level. Okay, looking at quality of life and psychosocial status, we were able to analyze 108 patients. These are the instruments, ERTC, quality of life, MFI, which is analyzing fatigue, and also questionnaire and psychosocial status, which we designed, and we were able to look at 108 patients. And the main risk factor we were interested in was hypothalamic involvement. Okay, and this graph shows you the results for the function domains of the RTC. And as you can see, patients with hypothalamic involvement when compared to patients without hypothalamic involvement, they had a lower self-assessment of physical functioning that was highly significant. And looking at the symptom scales, we were not surprised to see that these patients had more problems in, with regard to dyspnea because these are the more obese patients, but we were surprised and that's somehow a new finding that many of these patients are complaining of diarrhea and gastrointestinal symptoms. And looking at the fatigue score, the fatigue domains as measured by MFI 20, we saw that in patients with hypothalamic involvement, physical fatigue and reduced motivation are problems for the patients with hypothalamic involvement. The psychosocial status, once again, compared patients with hypothalamic involvement and patients without hypothalamic involvement. And we saw that the rate of partnerships and marriages was significantly lower in patients with hypothalamic involvement. And the driving licenses was, the frequency was lower. That's actually um, ex explained by the fact that these patients for sure had more uh, visual impairments due to supracellular extension of the tumors. What was surprisingly, possible, what was a surprise for us is a, that there was no difference in, in terms of employment and professional education, which um, alludes to the fact that many, most of these patients don't have cognitive deficits. Okay, challenges in treatment. We wanted to know whether outcome and development of severe hypothalamic obesity was related to the initial pre-surgical situation of hypothalamic involvement at already at the time of diagnosis before treatment, or whether hypothalamus sparing surgical strategies or hypothalamus damaging surgical strategies could be a, a, of the major effect for, for this sequelae. So we asked the question, what is the effect of surgical hypothalamic lesions on outcome in craniofaringioma patients with severe pre-surgical hypothalamic involvement? 
And in order to, to give you an impression what we mean by a certain by hypothalamic involvement, you have to, to um, look at this and uh, understand our grading system for hypothalamic involvement. Whenever the tumor does not involve the hypothalamic area, we say that's no involvement grade zero. If the tumor involves the area in front of the mammillary bodies, which is this area, we say that's an anterior involvement. And if there is a surgical lesion in this area, that's an anterior lesion, grade one lesion. And all other lesions and involvements involving the mammillary bodies in the area beyond, beyond are um, uh, graded as posterior or grade two hypothalamic involvement or lesions. That sounds rather theoretical. And this uh, slide shows you some clinical individual examples. On the left side, that's the pre-surgical situation, post-surgical situation. And here you see a small tumor confined to the cellar area, grade zero, no hypothalamic involvement, and the tumor is in, uh, resected. There is no lesion to the hypothalamus. So that's grade zero, hypothalamic damage, no damage. This is anterior involvement of the tumor. You still see the mammillary bodies. That's grade one, anterior involvement. And a part of this tumor is resected. Part of the anterior hypothalamus is surgically damaged. So that's a grade, C, a grade one hypothalamic damage. And this is the worst case, grade two involvement, the huge tumor involving all the area of the hypothalamus, the memory bodies cannot be identified anymore. And that's a complete resection where you have anterior and posterior hypothalamic damage. That's grade two pre-surgical involvement and grade two post-surgical lesion. And what we were interested in, this shows you the MRIs of patients. They all had severe anterior and posterior pre-surgical involvement. But the treatment was different. In this patient, only a capitor was implanted, no hypothalamic damage, so that's grade zero damage. In this patient, with severe involvement of anterior and posterior hypothalamus, only the anterior was then anterior hypothalamus was damaged, so that's interior hypothalamic lesion, grade one. And that's the worst case you know already, grade two involvement, anterior and posterior, completely resected anterior and posterior lesions. And what we had in our study, we saw that we had 109 patients who had anterior and posterior hypothalamic pre-surgical involvement, and these 109 patients received different treatments. 21% of patients received a surgical treatment which led to no hypothalamic lesion, 27% of patients in them there, there was a result of an anterior hypothalamic lesion, and in 52% of patients, anterior and posterior hypothalamus was damaged. So we compared these three groups uh, with regard to overall survival rate, PFS to BMI, SDS, quality of life, and also functional capacity. And this table only shows you that uh, these three sub-cohorts of patients without hypothalamic lesion, anterior surgical lesion, anterior posterior hypothalamic lesion was co were comparable in terms of gender, age of diagnosis, follow-up, and tumor size. And when we looked at the progression-free survival of these three cohorts, sub-cohorts, we saw indeed that patients who received anterior plus posterior hypothalamic lesions, that were the patients, the high-risk patients who had a gross total resection, they had a trend towards a better outcome with regard to progression-free survival. However, this was not statistically significant, but we, we could estimate that there might be a difference. And this is, the, I think, the most important slide, which compares the BMI SDS at the time point of diagnosis, one year after diagnosis, three year after diagnosis, and at last visit for the three groups of patients without hypothalamic damage with anterior hypothalamic lesion and anterior and posterior hypothalamic lesion. And all of these patients had severe hypothalamic involvement before diagnosis or at the time point of diagnosis. And what we saw, and you somehow you, you know, you have seen this before, that in patients with anterior and posterior hypothalamic surgical damage, there was this steep increase in BMI SDS, which you know already. And there was also the situation that the BMI um, kept stable at a very, very high level. 
actually in all groups, we saw a certain increase during the first year after diagnosis, but in the patients with anterior and posterior lesions, this was most impressive. We were also surprised to see that patients who had only anterior hypothalamic lesions, their weight development was similar to patients without hypothalamic lesions. And this is a busy slide which can be summarized. We looked at parental, that's um, on the lower two panels and self-assessment of quality of life at one year after diagnosis and three year after diagnosis. And we compared patients without hypothalamic lesion, anterior lesion and anterior and posterior lesion. And it can be summarized that during after one year, there was no significant difference. This occurred later on at, after three years, and there was a significant difference or significant differences in many domains of this um, pet uh, with, uh, with in a way that patients with anterior and posterior lesions had lower self-assessed quality of life when compared to patients without hypothalamic lesions. Okay, so from this we conclude that posterior hypothalamus sparing surgical strategy does not result in increased relapse and progression rates, improves quality of survival, and ameliorates the development of severe obesity also in craniopharyngeal patients at high risk for hypothalamic obesity due to primary pre-surgical anterior and posterior hypothalamic involvement. We can also conclude that anterior surgical hypothalamic lesions do lead to similar weight development like uh, patients uh, without hypothalamic lesions, and they seem to be acceptable with regards to risk of hypothalamic obesity. However, uh, we have also seen that neuropsychological sequelae seems to be related to anterior hypothalamic damage. And we looked at oxytocin and measured oxytocin in 34 craniopharyngeal patients and 73 healthy controls. We looked uh, at oxytocin in saliva and urine measured by an enzyme immunoassay. And uh, we wanted to know whether there are associations with gender radiation and the grade of hypothalamic involvement. And this was surprising. This shows you the oxytocin levels um, in controls, patients without hypothalamic involvement, patients with hypothalamic involvement. That's a situation before breakfast, after standardized breakfast, and this is a change. And we were surprised to see that patients with hypothalamic involvement, they had similar oxytocin levels. Oxytocin, you have to know, is produced in the hypothalamus and secreted via pituitary, but there were no difference, which we found. However, when we looked at the different grades of hypothalamic involvement, indeed, we saw that patients with grade one, and these are the patients with anterior surgical lesions, they had lower oxytocin levels before, especially before breakfast. And what we also saw that the change of oxytocin in the media of these patients was correlated with the grade of uh, obesity uh, with BMI STS. The higher the grade, uh, the, the BMI and the grade of obesity, the lower the degree of change in oxytocin. So we did a small cohort. We looked at the neuropsychological effects of a single administration of oxytocin in 10 craniopharyngioma patients. And we administered 24 units of oxytocin, single nasal administration. And once again, we measured oxytocin in saliva and urine, uh, this time by a radium assay, and we looked at neuropsychological parameters. This only shows you that in these 10 patients, they were comparable with our large cohort of the registry. And these are many data, but I would like to focus on only the fact that four of these patients, they were patients who had a grade one hypothalamic lesions. These were the patients where we have seen in the other trial, they had lower oxytocin um, measured. And we compared these patients with the others. Uh, this is also important. We looked at the urine and we indeed found that the oxytocin concentration in urine increased. That's important because when you give it nasally and you measure it in, in, in saliva, there might be a speculation that that what, that what you are measuring is simple contamination, but we saw that it was resorbed and it led to increases in urine concentrations. And this shows you that in 
the patients we had, uh, the, the patients with anterior lesions, these are the patients with solid lines, all other patients are dotted lines. And there was a trend, and this is no statistical analysis, but also only depicts the single cases, that especially in patients with anterior uh, lesions, this administration led to improvement of their neuropsychological findings. So from this, we conclude that craniofaryngioma patients continue to secrete oxytocin, especially when anterior hypothalamic areas are not involved. Oxytocin may have positive effects on emotion perception and craniofaryngioma patients improved assignment to negative emotions after oxytocin. I have not shown this, but that was observed. So last not least, a few slides about irradiation. I already mentioned that with uh, modern techniques such as proton therapy, we have better ways to treat these patients by irradiation. And we have done a study where we did a randomization. We did a randomization. One part of the patients were irradiated when there was an incomplete resection immediately after surgery, and the other part was irradiated when, uh, they when there was a, a, a progression of the residual tumor. And what we saw is that in patients who received an immediate irradiation, the rate of progressions and, and, uh, was significantly lower, whereas in patients who received the irradiation only in case of progression, we, there in this case, in this group, we found the progressions indeed. So from this, we saw that irradiation is effective in preventing progression of these tumors. This is a special situation of complete resection, but in many cases, this is not possible because they have cystic areas and these cystic areas are difficult to resect. And they are also difficult to irradiate because these cysts are changing their extension and thereby makes making it very difficult to do radiation planning. So in many of these patients, we insert an intracystic catheter. And with this catheter, we have the possibility to relieve pressure in these cysts and also to install sclerosing agents. And um, whenever you do this, you have first to check that this system is uh, tight, there is no leakage. And you see this is done by computer tomography. That's the inserted catheter. And then you are installing contrast medium. And you're looking that this contrast medium stays in the, the cyst. And this is the protocol published by Uta Bartels. And you see interferon alpha is um, currently the favorite substance which is installed in these cystic uh, structures. We, we do it three times per week for one week, one to four. So overall, three million units. And uh, the Toronto experience of wood bottles is very promising. They treated a small cohort and they saw that many of these patients had uh, at least um, um, partial remission. And actually it was very well tolerated. And just recently there was an international survey which could support these data. And last not need always an important question, how is the influence and the effect of growth hormone substitution, especially when you know that um, after during the first three years, there are frequent events in terms of progression and relapses. And we did an analysis of um, these treatment variables on the progression-free survival in 170 patients, including growth hormone therapy. And we were actually relieved to see that growth hormone therapy, growth hormone substitution actually had no significant effect on the progression rates in this uh, Cox regression multivariable analysis. So from this, I'd like to conclude my talk and uh, um, want to say that uh, a decreased growth rate is actually a pretty early symptom which should be mentioned. Um, the most, most frequent combination of symptoms is growth retardation, headache, and vision impairment. The treatment should always be in a way that it is hypothalamus sparing, not doing further damage to the hypothalamic structures, because the prognosis is severely impaired due to neuroendocrine sequelae, especially hypothalamic obesity. Further research is necessary on targeted therapy. There, in this case, the, the adult type of craniofaryngioma, the experiences are far more developed there. We have already treatment options. They are still under investigation for the childhood type of craniofaryngioma. And also new methods and approaches for treatment of hypothalamic obesity are warranted. And I think what's most important that, especially that the multidisciplinary approach in treating these patients is necessary. So I'd like to thank you for the 
uh, attention. I'd also like to thank the, the patients who support our research and uh, who are the, the persons who, who we are really, um, who are our friends in doing, in our, doing our research. Thank you very much.